Brian, do you want to ask some questions around the United States? Sure. Uh, I'm definitely interested to know what um, uh, what you involved yourself in politically, obviously with the Irish struggle, but also what 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 issues you found yourself getting involved in here in America that related to American uh, issues, labor issues. Um, uh, well, I was when you uh, arrived and what you did. And yeah, well, uh, uh, things were kind of bad then. What in other words, I walked along the docks, I, uh, and I found uh, I found the old toughs along the docks there to be damn good people. Were they union men? The oh, dock workers? Union men. They were. They were. They were longshore workers. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember one time to hear two of them talking about organizing one pier, and I had one sent to that. They all, what's this? No, he says we'd have to go rid of a few of them. <laughs> I remember one thing, something came up, uh, there was some cleaning up of the labor movement and ranting and finally they got before a judge and the judge says, oh, this really happened. He says, all right, tell me what happened. Well, your honor, he says, I got up and I made a motion. Okay, he made a motion. And then what happened? The lights went out. Okay, the lights, and then what happened? And he says, I went out. <laughs> so were you a member of the Longshore Workers Union? Yes. Do you know what local? I uh, belong to the, what the hell local? It's not there anymore, the Re Grain Handlers Union. But then, you, you know, if you was just like casual labor, you got a card. Yes. And you paid the, you paid the, into you know, but then, and what year were you working on the docks? And it was in Brooklyn here? Yes. In Brooklyn. Well, uh, in 40, 41, and, uh, and but, uh, i tell you a good one. About, uh, there was a, a couple of fellows, uh, Irish American lads, who were the James Cagney type, you know. They could fight too with their dogs, but they were on a couple of places, so I was a pinch hit with them once in a while, you know. Yeah. But uh, one of them, Paul, he was, he was a good fellow. Was, he closed it, they used to close the places down there around the water, and then about 10 o'clock, you know, or this and the other. And he had a poor Mike, Mike Harrison was his name too. So he'd leave him there. But I don't know cabaret and. and when they threw the scrambled eggs in the morning, they said, he says, let's go down to the place that Mike did. So they came down around 8 or 9 o'clock and they said, okay, me, Mike, let me in. It's 4. 1 o'clock, he says. Mike, he says, it's me. Let me in. 1 o'clock. He says, you're fired. Well, come in and fly me. I can't. I don't have the key. <laughs> Claim that there was people to stop it. He says, "What's wrong, sir?" He says, "I own this extreme that he's my porter won't let me in." <laughs> this is Mike Harrison. And uh, uh, you know his name. Uh, uh, the the, the porter's name was Mike Harrison. Ah, I, I see, I see. So during World War Two, uh, when you came here, uh, you came in what year? Uh, 1938. And did you have family who arrived before? Oh, all the family were here. How many brothers and sisters? Uh, well, I had uh, I had four sisters came, and two brothers. But then in 1949, I brought uh, all my family out. All your family? Yes. Uh, I had uh, the father and mother, and I had a disabled and invalid brother. And he couldn't hack it on him. He was all right, but he couldn't hack it on himself on his own, you know. And he, uh, he, uh, you know, needed to be taken care of. So I took them here in '49, and then my father died in '58. My mother in '67, and my brother in '68. You know. But uh, uh, my house became like a stopping off place then for some of the movement fellows from the north. Just like uh, was a safe place, safe house, you know. A safe house here in New York. Yes. For people coming. And then, in, uh, then in, uh, the big, then uh, when when Reagan Company, when they got elected, 
And of course, he collaborated with um, with Thatcher, you know, on the hunger strike. And the one thing that hurt me there, they said that um, some of the reactionaries, Thatcher was just as strong as they were. Yeah, so the only thing about her belly was full. And, you know, it's easy to be strong when you're strong, and again, you know, there's that much difference. And, and, and I says, uh, when it was over, the got part there anyways, you know, so I says, uh, she should be tried. She should be tried uh, as a war criminal. You know. They almost got her, and... Yes, they did. Yeah. They did a couple of minutes, and we wouldn't be talking about her to this way. So did you stay active in um, in the labor movement? Oh Here yes, sir. We had um, I worked in the I worked for Brinks, you know, for Brinks for some thirty odd years. We had a good little local there, eight, local eight twenty. Local eight thirty. Eight twenty. Twenty of what union? Uh, it was the Alma Car Workers Union. Um, uh, Teamsters. Teamsters. But uh, well, it was a combination of. Uh, two things. We elected a couple of young buckles and they didn't turn out to be so hot, you know. And then uh, bring some very anti-union and they pulled out. And uh, we uh, we uh, we uh, they pulled out of the union and we went on strike. We we uh, uh, we, uh, the, the fire of a few, and we went and walked with the picket line with them, you know. What year was that? That was uh, 84. 84. And uh, then uh, all of them, that's, uh, all of us, like the, the, the fire, the, the young fellas start trying to reorganize, see, because I told them, I said, you know, my days are about over, so. Uh, had to be up to you people, you know. But anyways, when they fired them, I walked out with them, you know. So they told me then, I just went in to pick up my pay in 86 of them. This is, uh, and so uh, well, maybe if you, uh, if you uh, went in and then, because you, so, you won't have, so I'll go in when you have 90 minutes when they go in with me, you know. Not, not until then. So they actually, they actually they have no, uh, uh, they have no, they won that case against us too. Of course, it was a Reagan National Labor Relations Board, you know, and you couldn't win, win there. But I would uh, hope now, you know, the, the labor movement here is on the rebound, you know. Under John Sweeney and all that, you know, they are a hell of a lot better than the others were, you know. And Owen Bieber is related to Brian, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Owen Bieber is a distant, distant relation of mine. Who? Uh, Owen Bieber, the former head of the AFL-CIO that Sweeney kicked out. The guy that Sweeney replaced. Oh yeah. Yeah. The That's right. Yeah. Company union man. Yeah. But by marriage. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. John Sweeney is a pretty decent fellow, I say, you know. He, is, uh, he removed a lot of that red bacon. Uh, you know, there was something. Or some of the people who were uh, who were uh, expelled or something. Uh, he uh, he uh, honoured them. You know. Well, of course, in. In the Teamsters and, I, and and most other unions in the in the 40s and, and 50s, there was a tremendous expulsion of communists and and, and uh, radical union members yes. out from the unions. Were you um, were you familiar with any? Well, uh, in other words, in um, in our union, it was more or less um, it was more or less uh, communist uh, founded. You know, your local and my, our local, yes. But then it went kind of pretty conservative, you know, in the, the McCarthy period and all this, that and the other, you know. And a few of the, uh, a few of the, uh, 
me at a, a bunker. I didn't know why it was that very well because I had only just but I, I see a sun, I think it's, it's, it's quite well up in the labour movement, you know. Unger? Uh, Unger, yeah, A. Bunger. I think I think this lad's name is his own uh, Unger. And the Teamsters? Yeah. I forget now, we had a damn good uh, Jewish fellow there. He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was loyal for us for a long time, but anyways, in the in the uh, red baiting days, in other words, there was uh, the red baiters were strong enough in the union that had to demand that he would he be replaced. You know, but so he told me, he says, "Don't worry, says, I'll make out. Says, Don't." And then, uh, aside from your own. The, the work you did with your own unions, How, did you relate to strikes in other unions and oh, sympathy I did. and I all of that? Was, uh, I was always, you tell us some of that? I was always in solidarity. You were in solidarity with just about everybody, aren't you? George? Yes, and with anything that left like a CW, you know. Then when the Daily News had a long strike here a few years ago, we uh, picked it their daily with them, you know. We, we're from the Detroit newspaper strike, which was related to the daily news yes, strike. Yes, that was a long strike. Yes, it was, it was very good. We yeah. picked it there, and I remember one of the, uh, this little girl, she was from the party. She used to come around with PWW. And uh, the one thing that was nice about that is they, uh, the, uh, you know, the coffee the joints, you know, uh, where the, the daily news people just so, you know, eat, you know, and all that. They were still always coming around every uh, noontime with coffee, rolls, and all this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. It was great, you know. Mm -hmm. And the one that's right, too. We lost the one in Detroit, but we had uh, a yeah. very similar circumstance. Yeah. Where Solidarity in the community. There was great. There was a. There was a few. Uh, a few uh, scabs, you know, come in and all this, that, and the other. And then there was a few. Uh, I think they got out their own daily news for a while, you know, mm -hmm. and it was labour donated. But uh, oh, there was a few. There was a few brash strike breakers. You, you know, he used to sell the paper in the in the uh, in the suburbs and all that. You know, but most of the people just didn't buy it. And there was one uh, there was one bar I was to stop into that in those years of Killarney Road down in town in New York. And, and this bum came in one night with the paper, but all of the people were there was. Union men, yeah. They chased us. I bet they did. <laughs> I bet they did. Um, obviously, the uh, issues around Central America were obviously important to you as well. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, activities? In well, no, it was the uh, June of the late fifties, like when. Uh, when the Cuban uh, Fidel, you know, when they were rebelling against uh, Batista, uh, we had a lot of contact with them then. You did? Yes, we had a lot of contact with them then. Under what auspices? Was there a well, the fair uh, play for Cuba? Was Well, was um, they had a... They were looking for weapons then at that time, you know. Oh, you were related that yeah, way? Yeah, that way, yes. And, uh, uh, so the July 26th movement was looking for weapons? Well, they, they imported it. They imported it. They had, to, they had to get a lot of their weaponry from here, you know. And, uh, so, Did you help uh, in that campaign, George? Huh? Did you help in that campaign? Oh yeah, well we was kind of mixed up, you know, and uh, 
friends meet friends and all this, that and the other. And there's one thing about it, I mean, they don't eat it heavy. You know, the working people. The working people. people they yes. just don't eat it, they do go, you know. And the funny thing about it is, um, here a few years ago, I, uh, I, got, I know quite a few Cuban people in this uh, this girl and her husband told me that um, they were very friendly with Fidel, you know, but her father came here and he was anti. And anyway, she says, I wouldn't go to, he wouldn't go back there, they're all tyrants and all this stuff. She says, Daddy, I ate away. He wouldn't. But anyway, she did. All right, she said, all right, she said, I'll go with you. Know. <laughs> he got off there and he knew her. He was told, you know, that nobody was talking to the other. He never heard such yabber in his life, you know, that's right. So there was, there was around uh, getting weapons to the July 26 movement, there were people in the Irish solidarity community who were supportive and helpful in that? Well, I mean, you just, uh, you just, I don't say they planned it, but in other words, uh, you go to the same source, you know. Go to the same source. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, the Cuban actually working people then, they don't eat it happy. So that's where the money came from, was from the actual Cuban people? As far as, as, far as I know, yes. yes. I mean, they, 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 uh, they got up the shekels, you know, there, or whatever, you know. And this is just after, or this is during the border campaign. Yeah, well, the border campaign went on from 56 to 62. And uh, what that border campaign, and uh, you know, I think they kept it on up too long, like, you know. There wasn't much of a point at the end, but what it is, is more or less resurrected the movement, you know. When, uh, when Jerry Bowden and company, when they went to the extent of Send an order for the hangman to have hang the then chief of staff Charlie and I thought that was over, but uh, I was, uh, was got to be very friendly with one of his comrades, the late Liam Carter, and, and uh, he said that was the, one of the lowest things they did, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said something clean and decent stuff of that. And, Bowling and company which got it in, that was the end of it. But instead of uh, just a few years, the people came out, began to reorganize, and then in uh, December the 12th, the balloon went up and it has uh, scarcely stopped since, you know, except for a few years of uncertainty in the 60s, you know, when the provisionals, the revisions come in again. They always go for the step and storm. Yeah. Jerry Adams and company, they're going for it now, you know. There's one thing about it, he travels a lot. Jerry? Yes. It's all that Wall Street money he's got, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, my... Shaky Armani. Uh, uh, I, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Adams never came here clandestinely, so uh, he didn't stay with me. But all the rest of them did, you know. All of them did. Oh yeah. yeah. But there's some of them. But by the way, what made them were good, you know, those whatever, you know. But some of them uh, are now. Uh, all gone. So no, it's gone. okay. It just died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He stayed with me a lot, you know. Wait, I'm sorry, say, Joe Cahill. Yeah. Oh, J Joe Cahill stayed with you a lot. Oh, he stayed with me a lot, and I had a great time with him and his wife Annie. She had a lovely singing voice, you know. Like I said, somebody has passed into history now. He played his part in the struggle. Oh, he did. He, 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 you know, he it surprised me when he took the, the steps that he did, you know. Mm -hmm. Really surprised me. All of us. All of us surprised me did Martin McGinnis. And me too. <laughs> yes, yeah. He was, uh, said, you know, he is a more real gentleman. Uh, th that's years ago, you know, and my older sister was alive then, and she liked him because he was like a young, I think he had two children then, you know. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't think he, t he took a drink at all. No, I think he's I, I, I don't he's think a teetotaler, he I think. And neither very little. For, in fact, any of them that I know, that their drinking was very, 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 very limited. Uh, and there were other figures from that period. Brendan Hughes. Uh, well, uh, he never stayed. He never stayed. No, he didn't know. The ones that stayed with me was like Rory Brady, Joe Cahill. Martin McGuinness, but Jerry Adams. Uh, wasn't your house being watched, George? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, I, uh, I was lucky enough. Well, for one thing, uh, you know, uh, it was a pretty good cover the way I, where I worked and all that stuff together, you know, and then. Uh, uh, I don't think I was under under suspicion, except you know, just papers and all this, that, and the other. There was, uh, but I liked. Uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of people uh, stay there, and uh, what I am really happy about now is. Uh, all the third and fourth generations that's going back to Ireland and see their own. That, of course, for my own family is very much so, you know. They're uh, going back and, and looking at their roots, you know. And I have a great time directing them, you know. What, what do you think it was about growing up as an Irish Republican that made you want to take part in labor solidarity struggles, that made you an anti-racist, that made you support well, uh, the Central American struggles? I think that I figured out they're all interrelated. They're all interrelated? Interrelated. How do you mean? Well, like in other words, uh, uh, say for instance Cuba, I mean their nemesis is the United States. We're an island, an island. It's an island country. Say Ireland is an island country, and the nemesis there was the Empire of Hell, as we call it. So there is, <coughs> there is. Uh, so you became not just an Irish Republican, but an anti-imperialist in general. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I had a. And I, I you have a lot of experiences on the job you know, uh, through the years. You know. uh, this fella came into me. There was a lot of conservative people you know, in print. And all that. Nice, nice people. But come in. This poor fella, a very conservative man. But he told me, Harrison, I never agree with you on anything. Can you tell me it was Jesus Christ the first communist? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, I don't know. He drove the money changers out. <laughs> Honest said, geez, I'm not kidding. He did fuck yeah. me with that one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I said, he drove the money changers out of the, out of the temple, you know. <laughs> and then, what about the Vietnam War, George? Oh, well, the same, uh, the same thing. We were opposed to the, we were opposed to the. So you supported the Vietnamese in the struggle? Yeah, like we used to uh, have rallies and all this, that, and the other. And uh, you know, I mean, we. Uh, yeah. well, I, can't, I can't say that I belong to any one of the uh, organizations, you know. But um, I was supported their rallies, you know. But many Irish Republicans in the United States at that time would not have supported uh, the anti-war movement here against Vietnam. Why was that? They were well, they, uh, more conservative. The more conservative of the uh, people who supported the Irish struggle they wanted to, uh, you know, keep well in with the powers that be, you know. But uh, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because the people who supplied the weaponry from here were all men of the left. They were? All men of the left. That is a fact. That is a fact. Uh, left of center. And Michael Flannery was a pretty, cons you know, an anti-imperialist man, but he was very firm, but he was... Um, 
he was uh, very fair-minded. You know, he made no uh, no uh, claims of being. But he um, he was always with the forces of progress. You know, and he was uh, in the later part of his life. You know, he was asked to do a lot. You know, and he stood up and and. Uh, they tried to make an example out of Mike because they grabbed him, you know, he was a gay, he was a, a rector of church, he was not now, no, he was a regular church man, you know, a regular, um, I don't know, I think Michael went every day Did he? when he retired, but he was, they grabbed him after coming out of church, you know, and wanted to make an example out of him, you know, and all this, that and the other. And, uh, uh, as much as uh, see what we think of, uh, but in other words, uh, they did their, uh, they did their, uh, the worst thing then because uh, he was like a father figure to the Irish community. Michael Flanner. Yes, mm -hmm. he was like a father figure, and uh, a lot of the people, you know, got turned off at this. You know, I remember in the, I remember in the uh, trial, you know, the the prosecutor Kirby, he was a mean. Too loud, you know. And I had him badgering Mike. You don't understand, Michael Flannery. I represent our government, and that you to answer the questions the way I tell you to. You understand that? Me, and Mr. Flannery, and in a quite tired voice, Mike says, "By times, by times, you understand me." He says, "By times." <laughs> and <laughs> he lost the jury then there because uh, there was that woman and they looked at him and said, who the hell? And I said, Jesus, when Mike was coming off, the, he stumbled, you know, a little bit, you know. And they looked at Fred Murray, who was a witness for me, he this guy's losing this jury. He's, he's, he's lost it. He's badgering Michael. They played it. Uh, that time the hunger strike was on, you know. So they had me tape, which I didn't know, you know, and Tom Fowler, father, my comrade, I was going up every evening to this, you know, to the... To, to pick the, it at the, the, the consulate. Uh, outside the consulate, you know. And this, uh, Waco, uh, I, the, this little girl, Meg Baker, Meg McKeown, she was there, she was just a young mother then. She's now, I mean, a fearful grown family, you know, but... She was a young uh, little mother there, but this, um, I had a few uh, leaflets or something. And I said, Meg, uh, get those leaflets out because we were going over to the, uh, to the uh, Queen Mary the next day, you know. And somebody said, Red Babe, them, you know. So I jumped on you know, and I was telling Tom about it, you know. And uh, the reason I'm telling you this. You know, it sounded rough, and Kevick was um, played it. He thought I looked like a savage, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I says, um, I said, this is Paco. I said, you know, if ever you, uh, if ever you say anything to this girl again, if ever you raise a voice to her, I said, I have no man, chance, and no time for a man who hits on a woman anything, but it was like, what? It's free to the later. Daylight through you. <laughs> and he played that. Yeah. He played that. Oh, yeah, in the court. And the jury started laughing. Yeah. Frank Durkin was tumbling. I know we're kidding about it, you know. The judge himself, he slumped on the. <laughs> <laughs> so that went bad. It didn't go over well for it the prosecution. It went over well at all. George, can we take a short break? Oh, by all means. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll get the. Okay. Okay. What do you want to say about your case? It was um, <clears throat> one of those things uh, somebody told him, you know, but uh, uh, he, he just got, he was coming up for a long sentence himself and he just got scared of it. Uh, he wasn't um, a planet, you know, he wasn't, so there's a guy kind of weak, you know, but anyways, um, it was the uh, defense was uh, organized from um, Ole Wire and Bernstein. That's right. And uh, actually, uh, referring to World War and Bernstein, there's organizations come and there's organizations go, but World War and Bernstein has been there as uh, an anti-imperialist institution. And the cause of Irish freedom wouldn't be as 
were here today only for uh, Oliver Wire and Bernstein, the past founders and their successors. Paul Oliver Wire and then now his successors, Brian Oliver Wire and Frank Turkin. And Frank and, Durkin. And Frank Turkin. Yeah. Frank Turkin is my passion in the tournament. <laughs> so uh, I remember uh, when we were in Boston, first of all, so we were at Houghton Bale, you know. And, uh, what year, George, were you busted? Uh, uh, 81. 81. And I remember Paul saying, we'll, there'll be no fee, we'll not fee you. But he says, that's a big thing to say, you know. Uh, but for McCombie said, because we need some... It would have cost, I think, uh, at least <coughs> the kind of... of a fee it would cost a million dollars. A million dollars to defend. It would have cost it. And I think it cost about forty-five or fifty thousand. So that was quite a, quite a. It went on, you know, it was on along, then it was on again, you know, for two months, you know. But uh, uh, it were great. And, but I remember Paul saying, "We're not going to fee you." So, but former committee, you know, that that's a tall order, you know. Right. But there's no question about it. Uh, the cause of Irish freedom and the cause of progress, anyway, so wouldn't be where it is today, only for a little while in Bernstein. Um, what were you charged with, George? Uh, well, uh, violation of the firearms, violation of the firearms act, or some other bloody thing, I forget now. But when well, he was. <laughs> All of which was false. You were falsely charged, weren't yeah, you, George? Yeah, <laughs> well, the thing about it is, um, the thing about it is, it would be uh, cowardly not to not to do something at that particular time. It would be cowardice not to do something, and would I'd brand myself a coward if I didn't, and and. Uh, but we did the best we could with what we uh, what we had, and the big thing uh, I apologise to the younger generation is that uh, we weren't able to send enough in over to get the Brits out. But like I said, we did the best we could, you know, with, with what we had, you know. And when when did you begin uh, procuring weapons? I think it was in the late forties or whatever. The late forties, yes. At that time, the, the small pieces and all this, that, and the other, but you'd always be able to pick up a few, you know. And by the early 70s, when it was clear that the provisionals needed a different different level of weapon. Oh, they did need, need uh, to protect the communities. And, and is that when you, during the 60s and after the border campaign, did you... Uh, well, we had some left over from the border campaign. You had camp. some left over. And then when we, um, when it started to, you know, build up again, then, you know, there was all this agitation and all that. I said, don't rule out the arms struggle, you know. That, that's one moment, one moment, we have to change. Okay. Can you repeat that, George? Uh, yes. Like, um, what we had left over, we, uh, from the uh, 56 campaign, we, we turned them over to when Europe began to build up again, and uh, there were some people thought they could agitate, you know. But I says, uh, don't rule out the armed struggle because that's the one language that they that the Brits fear. And what and what year was this? That'd be about you know getting into the late some uh, late sixties. Um, Did you have any? Uh after the border campaign went so badly, wrong in the end, and it, or it fell apart in the yes. end, did you have any worries that uh, a new campaign might lead to the same? No, I knew that it would come back again because um, the forces of, uh, see, the old timers had built up a solid organization like Paddy McLaurin, Moss McCott, and Tony McCann, and then the people who took over at the end in this, in the 62, you know, they ran it into the ground, you know. 
So you're Tom um, um, Carl Goulding and this group of people. Here. Yeah, it is. You know, I, I don't like to mention them, but I yeah. call them the forces of revisionism. You know. Forces of revisionism. Uh, in other words, I think they ran it into the ground. And the forces of uh, revisionism that took the life of Paddy McLaughlin. That's right. So uh, then as now, in other words, uh, the ghost of McLaughlin stands between me and uh, revisionism. Uh, but you, what I find fascinating is you're a man of the left, a working man of the left, and at that time it was widely seen that the split in the Republican movement in the 69-70 was between the officials on the left and the provisionals on the right. What made you, what made you not go with the officials and go with the provisionals? Well, because in other words, uh, that definition of it, you know, it wasn't a real left-right. That's right. When, if it wasn't the ways it was the. Um, they were, uh, they weren't really left. <coughs> Some of them were ex rightists too, you know. They were. Yes. And uh, they weren't, uh, they weren't genuinely left. Nick Clare now in Ireland, you never know, like I had, like, some kind of like Paddy McLaughlin from us before. You never know, you have no worry about Nick Wren, you know, just where he stands yes. and forever, you know. And you have no problem at all with him. Because see, they had him on Radio Free and he says, uh, I'm an Irish communist, you know. To this day he says this. Oh, well, he says that to this. Good for him. I want to meet Mick Reardon. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know how much you want to get into to that particular situation of the, with the provisionals in the early 70s, but it would be appropriate to say that, that you helped build up the provisionals into a force that could defend the communities. Yes, and then you had to, um, when they, um, we supported the uh, officials like that, until they pulled out in 72. Okay, so 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 you you weren't just supplying weapons to the provisionals, but also to the officials. Yes, as long as they continue to fight. Okay, I didn't. And then when they pulled out of the fight, well, then they didn't need them anymore, you know. What were were there arguments over here about the officials versus the provisionals in? Oh yes, there was. Yeah, there was. They, uh, <coughs> there was people, you know, came along and. For a while, everybody wanted to be a gun runner, you know. And uh, but the thing about it is, the talk and talk and talk. But the thing about it is, this: the feds, you know, would follow them and all this stuff. And, and I spread the word around, you know, let them go to the Blarney Stones and all this, you know. <laughs> uh, somebody told me that. <laughs> They talked to some, uh, they were paid an, ofi an official visit from the feds or something like that. And uh, the guy says, Why the hell don't you go to the Blarney Stone? You get them all there. All we got there was shit. He says. <laughs> <laughs> so there were plender, there was plender, there was plender roll, you know. Yeah. I remember this great big fella came around. Oh, a huge man. Uh, this is well, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, anyways, you know. So I, you know, used, used to go to all the pickets that I went up anyways, and he was, he was a big member of the IRA. You know, he says, I says, yes. <laughs> anyways, when I was born, he says, you see that? I says, yes. <laughs> yeah, I do, you know. But anyways, he disappeared. <laughs> he disappeared after the boss. Yeah. But he was there, member of the IRA. You, you might as well said member of the FBI. Huh? Yes, he was uh, <laughs> He, he was a man to be reckoned with him. <laughs> I have some questions, George, about how you related your struggle as an Irish person in Ireland and as an Irish immigrant to the United States with the struggle of African Americans and immigrants in this country. Well, uh, <coughs> I figured I always was against slavery, and I think it's wrong to sell people at the auction block and all this, that, and the other. 
I guess the forerunner of that was uh, was John Brown. He was, uh, and he was white, and uh, uh, he played the same role there, I think, as um, to the American Civil War. At least one thing the American Civil War did. There was no more auction block there. You just didn't sell it, whatever, you know. I think he played the same, same role to the Civil War as uh, probably the International Brigade did in, in the anti-fascist fight, you know. He was, they were premature. Premature. Anti-fascist, and then they were premature anti-racist, you know. But bellwethers of the future. Hmm? Bellwethers of the future. Yes, right. In uh, in the labor movement, or in, in, in your workplace, you must have run into I mean, quite a bit of racism among uh, white workers, even though it was the union. Well, uh, actually, uh, actually, when I went on that job, more or less it was nearly all white. It was all white? It was almost, yes. And uh, then it changed, you know, and all this, that, and the other. And uh, all of the... Uh, all of the uh, African people were good, good fellows, you know, good, and whatever, you know. And one of them was a witness of Fred Murray's. He was a star witness for me at my trial, you know. And he was a union brother of yours? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. He came in, I well, I well remember when he came into the courtroom. He had a straw hat on, you know, and all this, that, and the other. And he was some ways related to Fred Douglas. Could you have your, your, your name, sir? He says, Frederick Douglas Murray. <laughs> what, there's, there's a few uh, African people on the jury that looked at him, but he that out his Frederick Douglas Murray. So the little creep of a prosecutor system, Mr. Murray, were you s surprised or offended when your friend Harrison was sending him going to terrorist on Ireland. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. He says. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be surprised if he wasn't. That's enough for them, you know. George, there, there uh, has historically been, for example, in the busing in Boston, has historically been uh, an image of, uh, of Irish Americans, not Irish immigrants necessarily, but Irish Americans as as uh, sort of hardened racist communities because they were commi competing for the lower jobs in these neighborhoods. How do you think that, why do you think that the struggle in Ireland didn't radicalize Irish America the way the struggle that was happening in Latin America or in Africa or among Native Americans radicalized those communities? Well, because uh, the first place, the uh, first place, like, you know, the the cadre that kept the struggle going, you know. There were, it was kind of a small group of dedicated men and women. And I would say women were there, all was there. The group that I support on, and now on Ireland Republic in Sinn Féin, women has to uh, avoid some decision making. It's no longer just cooking food or something. And the continuity IRA is the same thing, you know. I know why the way all said that was we were more or less protective, you know. That's whatever, you know. But uh, but you think that has changed? Oh, that has changed. <coughs> that has changed now. Then the, the people that I um, support in Ireland, the, the woman has the voice in decision making, and it's a damn good thing to have because. <clears throat> they were always unbroken. 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 In uh, going back to, I, w I would like to speak more about women in the Republican movement and in, in the. Uh, I'll tell you one more. Yeah. Uh, I, I said, you know, people were. Constance Markovitz, you know, and 
an old timer, Joe Steins, told me one time, Jesus, George, he says, you know, I felt funny. Concert Mark can come up there swinging a lion, it's 45, right? And she said, that's funny, but a, mush, a woman having a 45, you know, and a horse to run. He, he was, you know, he wasn't a really against women, in fact, he was another, she said, that's funny, you know. And then he came back and she had a gun there. I said, she, anybody would give her any such shit. But then, you know, that's the kind of, you know, did you ever meet Connolly's daughter? Uh, yes, one of them was, was out here. In fact, she stayed with me about a month there. Uh, Nora. Nora. Nora Connolly stayed with you. Yeah, about about a month, yes. Years ago. We haven't been well. Yeah. She is a nice lady. She liked to smoke a bush. <laughs> you know, that and the other. And, uh, but she did tell me, uh, it was great to talk to her, you know, she did tell me, uh, Nona, he used to call her. She is her father, you know. He called her back the last time he saw her. He says, "No, he says we rise again." This is before he was executed. Yeah, and uh, it's a funny thing that the Brits uh, they were stupid. Connolly would have only lived a few weeks because gangrene had set in and everything, but they just couldn't wait. You know. They strapped him to a chair to kill him. Strapped him to a chair. The the, the English doctor he was uh, surgeon. You know, he was he was. Uh, Raving, you know, he says, Jesus, maybe he says, you know, I should have amputated, you know, and all that. You know, that might have saved him, you know. He says, I wonder, if, you know, if I had amputated his leg, you know, he was going to lose it anyway. But, uh, uh, but Nona, uh, Nona says, she, his, her dad said for Nona, he says, we'll rise again. Can you talk about other women in the struggle? Can you name some other women in the struggle? Well, there uh, was a, a great woman in the struggle would be Maud Gawn McBride, you know. I remember to see her. Um, you saw Maud Gawn McBride? I saw her. I was only at Board of Town once in my life, and that was in 1935. And her son spoke that day, Sean McBride. He was an agent general, but she, uh, she, uh, you know, had the widow's weeds or everything, you know. She was a striking woman. Mary McSweeney, uh, Mary, well, she had kind of a, a lame step, I think, you know. And then, uh, of course, uh, Bernadette Devlin, you know. Uh, she's like a genius, you know, in her own right. And then there's women like, um, there's uh, Mary Ward, she comes here. Uh, her husband uh, died in hunger strike uh, as a result of the hunger strike, and uh, she's a fine lady. And her daughter is getting married. In, I think uh, I think she's getting married this month somehow. She has two daughters, and she's getting married. And uh, I think it's to an islander. Mm. Uh, I think it's uh, you know she's um, but she comes here and she says she's a great egg. And uh, the woman who was assassinated in Royal Victoria Hospital. In oh, Mairead Farrell. No, she, 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 she was, Mairead Farrell was Gibraltar. Yeah. Um, what was... Another great woman. I mean, it is um, Anne Devlin. Anne Devlin. Yes. She was tortured and everything, but she wouldn't give Emmett away. Of the probably uh, when you look at Emmett with his genius, you know, all he had to give not only to Ireland but to humanity as well. And they took him away from us at 25 years of age. Christ, just imagine what he would have developed into, you know. And when you see, figure a man like that, you know. And, uh, you know, give a speech like that before a hostile judge, you know, and jury and all that. And he probably didn't have much nourishment that day or anything, you know. And, uh, Jesus, when you, when you think of what they were, not only robbed us of, but robbed uh, humanity of, too, you know. 
How do you think the uh, the black struggle in the United States influenced the Irish struggle rather than the other way around? Because "We Shall Overcome" was certainly the, that was the song that was being sung. Martin Luther King. You know? Yeah, yeah. They followed. Um, that did a lot of thing, you know. And it broke down the. It broke down. Uh, you know the racism. Uh, the jury that uh, put in me was like half and half, you see, and a lot of the witnesses were, you know, whatever. Uh, How did you feel about uh, the rise of black militancy here, as it was analogous to the rise of Irish militancy? Well, it was, black the, same as, um, it was the same as um, the, it was the same as the. Radical lads in Belfast, or boy and women and everything, you know. So you would have equated what the Black Panther Party was doing with what people were trying to do in Belfast? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Were there people in Ireland that you know of reading, um, you know, Malcolm X? And the, or, oh, I think so, yes. I remember, <laughs> I knew this kind of a very nice couple in, uh, in Philadelphia. And they were very, they weren't racist, but Bernadette came here, you know, and right away she went to see the Black Panthers, you know. And this woman, she had a cotton, or she had a, she had a, a northern accent. George, she went to see the Black Panthers, she says. <laughs> <laughs> and she, when I mentioned well, she says it was just like going to see a bunch of Belfast lads and all this, that, and the other. Yeah. What, you, that would have been in the early 70s when she came over? Yes, yeah, probably the late 60s or the early 70s because um, uh, the couple that I was very friendly with all through the years, you know. But they were kind of a little bit conservative. They weren't ready for this yet, you know. Yeah. I'm sure she just don't see the black panthers. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any relationships with, with the Black Panthers or I mean, just in uh, temporary, you know, walk I walk with them and all this, that and the other. So you did work with them? Yes, you know, yes. I walk with them and all this, that and the other. How did the rest of the Irish Republican community here feel about you working with the Black Panthers? Well, uh, this probably some of them would be I was an embarrassment probably to some of them. But then, uh, then the movement in Ireland never told me what I should do anybody, and uh, that goes for today, and I think Rory Brady and, and his brother, the two able statesmen, you know, and, and uh, the women too, you know. I think they're, uh, they're, uh, they're following a very, uh, a very historical, and, uh, and a very uh, unrelenting uh, uh, struggle, you know, they're in line with the, with the centuries old struggle, you know. I could see them walk hand in hand with Tone or any of the great men or women of the past.